I'm going to tell you about the next program, uh, which uh, is one you shouldn't miss. A, a friend of mine named Bruce uh, Tucker uh, is a World War II historian. Uh, <coughs> during the last months of uh, the Battle of France in 1940, uh, with victory all but assured uh, by the Nazis, Nazis' favor, the British became increasingly concerned about the disposition of the French fleet, which was in uh, North Africa. The French fleet at that time represented the size, uh, the fourth largest fleet uh, in the world. And uh, its battleships and cruisers uh, were very anxiously uh, looked at by uh, Hitler. But the, the instrument of surrender uh, provided that Vichy would have control of those ships, and Hitler promised, for whatever that's worth, mm -hmm. never take control of those ships. Uh, of course, we, we all know uh, the worth of Hitler's promises. Consequently, uh, Churchill uh, decided, I'm not buying that, and he made a sudden uh, un unannounced attack uh, on the uh, British, uh, the French fleet, uh, and destroyed numerous of the ships. Uh, Churchill's one who ordered the attack. The uh, French Navy was at the, the base in French Algeria, and the raid was on July 3, 1940. And of course, they were not expecting the assault. And something like 1,300 French were killed. Uh, it served the purpose of putting the French fleet out of action, and the Nazis never did get, get control of any of those ships. But that affair had, had a profound and long-lasting impact on the relationship between France and England, who were erstwhile allies, uh, and caused some very unusual uh, changes in strategic maneuvering uh, during Operation Torch in December of, um, of 1942. Uh, and there was a suggestion made that the French, uh, rather that, that the English, uh, invaders who were joining with the Americans uh, should wear American uniforms and flags because uh, that way maybe they would get shot at. Uh, but I don't think that would carry too far. Uh, anyway, it's a very little, little known aspect of World War II. Uh, Bruce Tucker, I've heard him give this lecture before. It's very worthwhile. Again, you remind you about our holiday party, December 17. It's going to be at Mayfair because one of my favorite heating places in New Jersey, Faust Cabin, is closed. It's now, we needed another Walmart, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> was it a Walmart or a... Uh, a Walgreens drug store. Is it a Walmart? Yes. A Walmart drug store. Yeah. Walgreens. Walgreens. Yeah. We're a little short of drug stores around here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, before you introduce our speaker, uh, I want to say that we have some of uh, Catherine's um, books here this evening. Uh, I get these books at Barnes & Neville at a discount, and since the book club is a non-profit, not-for-profit organization, uh, uh, they can be purchased without payment of any New Jersey sales tax. And for the discount price of $20, it's a good buy. It's a wonderful read, and we encourage our members to buy the book as a way of saying thank you uh, to our speakers. <coughs> Right now, about Miss Prince. She's the author of several books. The author of uh, one book, uh, A Professor, A President, and A Meteor, The Birth of American Science. And for this, she won the Connecticut uh, Press Book Club for Nonfiction. Uh, she's also the author of Burn the Town and Sack the Banks, the Confederates Attack Vermont, The Birth of American Science. That also won the Connecticut Press Club's 2001 Book Award for Nonfiction. She's also the author of Shot from the Sky, American POW's 
in Switzerland, which I'm going to take a look at. That sounds like a fascinating book. Catherine worked as a correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor in Switzerland and in New York, where she covered the United Nations. Uh, Ms. Prince works now as a freelance, freelance journalist and is also an adjunct professor of journalism at Quinnipiac University. She received an award from the Military Writers Association for the book she's going to speak, out, speak about tonight in <coughs> the Pacific. Uh, Ms. Prince lives in Western Connecticut with her husband, Pierre is Sadlinger. Is that pronounced correctly? Sadlinger. Sadlinger. Okay. I keep. Does anybody make a mistake and say um, Pierre? Sadlinger? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I almost did. Uh, uh, with her husband, Pierre, and two children, a 15 year old son, and a 12 year old daughter. Please welcome Kevin Prince. Gave him a little bit of an idea of what I was looking into. 
and he agreed that I could come up and visit with him. So I spent a weekend interviewing Horst and talking with him. Well, Horst was a 10-year-old boy at the time of the sinking. And, and today, nearly 70 years later, as you can imagine, it still haunts him very much. And he thinks about this every day. Through our conversations, I came to understand that though the loss of life was massive, and as desperate as the conditions were that forced Horst and his mother to flee and the thousands of others just like him, stories like his really had remained largely unknown. But I knew that, to, that after just even the first hour of meeting him, there was just something about him and the way he was speaking with me that I thought his story and those of the other survivors had to be told. So this book is the story of what I found. And it's the result of interviews with some of these survivors, and it's the result of time spent in archives. So in early 1945, the end of the war in Europe is in sight. This is in January. Um, and it's pretty clear by this point, January, I think, and some may disagree, but that, that the Allies were going to win the war in Europe. The Americans and the British were closing in from the West and the Soviets were closing in on Berlin from the east. Many civilians in this part, um, East Prussia, and some soldiers, those coming back from the uh, Eastern Front, wanted to abandon these volatile areas of Europe by any means possible. Certainly for those in East Prussia, the civilians wanted to leave because they knew that the oncoming Red Army would do unto them what had been done as the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union so many years before. But until January 1945, these civilians are not allowed to leave. They are under orders to remain, for to leave or to ask to leave or to try to leave is to show defeatism to the Nazi leadership and you could have been executed for trying to do that. So it wasn't until mid-January 45, the end of January 45, that there's permission now to leave and to flee. So at this point, um, as many of you are familiar with, Operation Hannibal is going into effect, which is organized by Admiral Dunitz, to try to help the civilians get to Allied lines. They, they know that um, at least if they can surrender to Americans or British, their fate might be better than to have to surrender to the Soviets. So at this point, civilians are massing along the Baltic Sea um, from ports like Gottenhafen, which is present-day Gdynia, Poland. So January 28th, January 29th, you have thousands and thousands of German refugees or East Prussian refugees, wounded soldiers, who try to secure passage on the Wilhelm Gusla. And they want to escape across the Baltic Sea to Kiel, Germany, which is still Germany, but it's closer to Denmark, it would be closer to the Allied lines. So sometime after nightfall on the 30th, the Gooseloff cautiously set sail. And the trip was really only supposed to take about 12 hours. Well, as you may know, uh, three torpedoes from a Soviet submarine struck the boat, causing catastrophic damage and throwing passengers into the frozen waters of the Baltic Sea, um, just off the coast of present-day Poland. Those aboard the Gooseloff include women and children and elderly and, re and their refugees. They do also include members of the Kriegsmarine or German Navy, and there are also included members of the Women's Auxiliary, there's about just slightly less than 350 women um, naval auxiliaries. Because history is defined as much by what becomes part of the official record as by what is left unrecorded, few know this story. In this case, German censorship, Soviet suppression, and Western indifference buried the Guslov story in the immediate years after the war. Refusing to let the flailing Third Reich hear of defeat, Hitler prohibited officials from reporting the sinking. The Soviet Union suppressed the story partly because it doubted the integrity of the so submarine commander 
And also to talk about the Guslov after the war might have forced the Soviet Union to cast light on their own atrocities. In the <coughs> West, the event remained buried first because of war fatigue, <coughs> and then it was overshadowed by the Cold War. And also in the years, in the immediate years and decades after the war, this was something that befell civilians of our enemy. And so that was also another reason to not consider what happened. For nearly 70 years, the story has remained uh, relatively hidden. As I mentioned, the victims themselves inspired little sympathy. After all, I, 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 it's my opinion that World War II, perhaps more than any other war in recent history, is still portrayed in stark lines of black and white. So last winter, I was on a trip with my family. Uh, it was the winter break, and we took our children down to visit Williamsburg, and we stopped in Gettysburg and Jamestown. Um, so while we were in Gettysburg, I was drawn to what some of the newspaper articles, how they, were, they had covered the Battle of Gettysburg. I was drawn into one in particular, this quote, every name is a lightning stroke to some heart and breaks like thunder over some house and falls a long black shadow upon some hearthstone. And that quote resonated with me. For every name aboard the Guslov that perished was a lightning stroke to some heart. And the story of the Guslov, with all its human drama, not only resurrects history, but raises provocative questions about loss, survival, and how those impacted continue on year after year and decade after decade. And so with that uh, bit of an introduction, I'd like to share with you some photos and some slides, most of which are not in the book itself, but also, I think, flesh out the story of the sinking of the goose log. Doing this, right? Just the. Just the one. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yes. Oh, okay. oh, you did that. Just tell me I'll change it if you want. Okay, it should be good. Okay. You good? So, well, let me just. It's not going to work. I, I, just tell me to change right, it. Alright, I'll. I'll, I'll <laughs> okay, well, on May 5th, uh, 1937, just one day before the German passenger ship, the Hindenburg crashed and burned, not terribly far from here, at the Lakehurst Naval Air Station, the Wilhelm Gustloff was launched. A 25,484 ton ship, 684 feet long, the Gustloff was the pride and joy of Germany's KDF, or Strength Through Joy Fleet. And again, just to give you a little bit of comparison, the Titanic was 46,000 tons and 882 feet long. And I use the Titanic in these instances because so many of us just have that visual, I think. Well, the Hindenburg caught fire and was destroyed after it failed to dock with its mooring mast. There were 97 people aboard the airship and 36 died. When the S-13, a Soviet submarine, torpedoed the Guslov, more than 9,000 died. And I use this, this Hindenburg, I think the timing to me is just interesting. But both ships were launched with great fanfare. However, both strike a different chord in our collective memory. The airship doesn't quite carry the weight of Nazi Germany in the same way that the Guslov does. And there's good reason for that. So if you, it's, it's difficult to make out, but at the lower portion of this picture, what sort of just looks like kind of fuzzy, like a George Seurat, you know, rendering of people, is, is people. There were hundreds and thousands of people came out to see the Gustloff launched. It was just launched with great fanfare. And it was built specifically to symbolize the strength and power of the Third Reich. In fact, it's named for Wilhelm Guslov, who was the assassinated leader of Switzerland's Nazi party. Guslov was a friend of Adolf Hitler, and so when David Frank assassinated him, um, Guslov was at home at the time, Hitler seized on that as another tool of propaganda, and it was decided that they were going to be building these ships for their Strength Through Joy program 
what better way to, uh, in Hitler's view, honor this man and show the reach of the Reich by naming this ship after him? Say if I can. Oh, okay. So, this um, is a menu that you're seeing here, and roughly translated, it says, it says, you know, special trip of the German work front. The Germans started the KDF program in the mid 1930s. And it was a large-scale social program to deliver, amongst other things, recreation to the people. The KDF was part of the German Labor Front, and it was established in 1933 after the Reichstag had abolished trade unions. So everybody who was aboard the Guslov in these early days of it cruising um, were members of KDF. They were members of the German Labor Front, and that was not a voluntary membership. It's if you worked in a factory, for example, you would be a member of the Labor Front, and you had to pay dues. The KDF offered sporting events, operas, harvest festivals. It celebrated Hitler's birthday, and it also, amongst other things, launched the cruise liners. Until then, most Germans really had not traveled outside of their country, in some ways, like most people in the 20s and 30s, you know, international or even just traveling to another country was not done with regularity. And Hitler, again, and the Third Reich saw these cruise ships as a way to sort of spread the reach of the Reich. So in this uh, slide here, you can see the Guslov docked there in the back. Um, the the Guslov visited Africa, the coast of Africa, it went to Scandinavia, it w made ports of call in the Mediterranean. One woman that, um, in one presentation I was giving, told me how she remembered the Guslov coming into Scandinavia, you know, and when it, when it came, people actually were not happy because the passengers would come off and they, they wouldn't spend any money. They would just kind of come, visit, go, and you know, usually dressed in this sort of very folkloric garb. The idea on the Guslov, just as it was in Nazi Germany, was there was to be no first or third class. Everyone was supposed to be the same. And so in that way, again, it's another propaganda tool for the Nazi, Nazi Germany. Interestingly, the Guslov was also used not just in these cruises, but for example, um, in 1938, when uh, for Anschluss, the Guslov sailed up the Thames, and Germans who were living in London at the time were ferried out to be able to uh, vote, and I put quotation marks, uh, marks around that, for Anschluss. And um, what I found <coughs> interesting was that Life magazine at the time has a two-page photo essay of this vote, and it's it's very disconcerting to look at that. There's a picture of it in the book because you really don't get any sense that Life magazine, its photographers or its writers are portraying this with the, um, with what we know is just such a very sinister time. The, the photo spread sort of looks very happy and, and joyous. Um, so that's just a little aside. Well, the boat is used as a cruise liner in its early days. And then um, September 1939, Germany invades Poland. Guslov, the Guslov now becomes a hospital ship for the sick and wounded. A wide green band is painted around her hull, and there are red cross symbols painted on the decks and the stack. So never again is the Guslov going to leave dry dock. It's now docked in Gotenhafen, which is today Gdynia, Poland. In 1940, the Guslov is designated as an accommodation ship for U-boat trainees. At this point, the Guslov is painted gray, and um, it is never repainted white, and there are never hospital, mark uh, hospital markings painted on it again which is important, of course, because when it leaves as an evacuation ship, I've been asked, well, were there hospital, were there Red Cross symbols on it to show that this was a boat carrying civilians? And, and no, it, it was not. Reasons for that you know, come to, was it a question of time getting out? Did the Germans not care? You know, that's one of these that's really not answered. 
But in any event, in the 40s, as it's used for the U-boat trainees, sailors learn survival skills, for example, in the swimming pool, they are berthed on board, and as you can see, there's officers here uh, dining aboard the Goose Law. So now I take you to Konigsberg, East Prussia. Today it's Kaliningrad, um, Russia. So just three weeks after Hollywood's uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater premiered The Wizard of Oz to eager audiences here in the United States, the wine of airplanes fills Polish skies. And that's September 1st, 1939. On the 10th, German forces march in from the west and the Russians march in from the east. East Prussia is still relatively untouched. All the laws are going to affect. So by being untouched, I by no means mean that uh, you know, Christ, um, men of fighting age are first rounded up and sent off, Jews are being rounded up, but the actual fighting has not quite reached these cities yet. Um, however, the Nazis started to requisition property and for example, the Reuter furniture factory and showroom. Um, this factory had slave labor working in it, which was mostly Russian POWs. And the Nazi regime forbade anyone to leave until 45. So I'm showing you this slide um, because in the next, in one moment, you're going to say, well, Hel um, Helga Reuter, uh, Knickerbocker, and she's one of the survivors that I interviewed for the book. Well, Helga is pictured here with her older sister, Inga. Um, on one of their summer vacations on the Baltic Sea. And it was just a sort of poignant photo to see so many years later. This is something that they look forward to going, you know, every summer with their parents as the thousands of the East Prussians. Um, it's also uh, remarkable in that Helga even has this photo. At the very last moment, I won't divulge too much, it's in the book, Helga and her sister flee. Inga is older. And so Helga's father decides Inga should be in charge of all the documentation, any kind of money. And she'll hold on to that. When Helga wants to have something from home, she doesn't know, of course, if she'll ever go home again. So she wears her father's trousers uh, to leave. She has them hemmed and shortened. And in the back pocket, which is fastened by a button, are some photos that incredibly survive Helga's descent into the Baltic Sea, subsequent rescue. Um, Inga does not survive, and you know, you'll read further about her. This um, is uh, the Reuter girls and, and their mother, just another family photo. So here's a model of the Gustav. And uh, when the Gustav was built, and it was intended, of course, as a cruise liner initially, it was built to comfortably transport about 1,500 passengers um, <coughs> and between four to 500 crew. There were 22 lifeboats and 12 transverse bulkheads, which would have made for 13 watertight compartments. Each of the lifeboats was designed to hold 70 people. Well, on the date, I think there were upwards of 10,000 people aboard. There's eight decks, and most of the refugees are um, below the promenade deck. So the promenade deck is that sort of glass-enclosed one just below the light bulbs. And that, that just became a trap for them. Um, so whether there were, you know, there's been talk about that there weren't enough life vests, for example, aboard, um, whether you know, more people got into lifeboats, would that have made a difference? But of course, you know, the timing of it of being torpedoed and sinking, it was all in about an hour and a half. Um, and you can certainly picture the chaos as this boat goes down very quickly, that um, more lifeboats are getting to the other side of the ship might not have made a difference in survivability. This is Helga today. Um, she now lives in Las Vegas. Um, like the other survivors, Helga did make it into a lifeboat. And she's holding here uh, her identity card. So boats that were in the area that night that heard there was a, a distress call able to get out, those boats were able to come and rescue survivors. There was, a, there was no organized rescue operation as such. So the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, did not organize anything. 
Those that survived, like Helga, were taken to the island of Rügen, which is in the Baltic Sea. Um, that in and of itself is a story. Um, that was also a KDF project to be sort of the biggest, um, you know, no class separation hotel project. Once there, the German Red Cross processed people and essentially sent them on their way. This is a photo of a boarding pass for the Gusla. So the first people, the first refugees to get to Gottenhafen in those last couple days before sailing were able to get boarding passes. You know, they were trying to keep some kind of record of who is getting on board. Uh, most people didn't have them. It was just getting extremely chaotic. People were getting very desperate and just cramming themselves in any way onto the boat. There were stories of that because preference was given to uh, mothers with children, that babies were passed up and down the line just to be used to help people board. And what is, you know, sort of in retrospect, it's horrific to think of people in small boats trying to follow the goose left to be able to, you know, pleading to be taken aboard. I mean, it was seen as that would be their salvation. So now I'm taking you over to Latvia. This is the home of Irene Chinkor East and her sister Ellen Chinkor maybe two sisters that you will meet in the book. These two sisters were deported with their parents from Latvia in 1939 after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is signed. The reason being is that though the Chinkor family was, um, had Russian ancestry on the maternal side, their father had, had uh, German ancestry and so they were, one, two, there's many words we can use for it, but reclaimed by the Nazis as part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And so they're deported, they're sent to East Prussia to recolonize East Prussia, which at this point, of course, has been rid of um, Jews and Slavs and anyone that the Nazis deem undesirable. Well, um, it was, you know, uh, it's shocking is not quite the right word, but for Ellen and Irene, you know, these young girls at the time who don't speak a word of German, don't identify German, don't understand, you know, suddenly they find themselves in East Prussia having to, you know, being put into Hitler Youth, and um, so their story is, is quite fascinating. These are the two sisters today, and they also live in Canada. Hmm. Um, their father, that, that picture that you had seen before with the pretzel, their, their family was in the baking business. So their father was able to open up and, and he ran a bakery in Gottenhafen. And so that business was deemed essential. So he was not going to be allowed to go. Um, the sisters and their mother and one of their cousins do secure passage on the Guzla. Meanwhile, the rest of their family, any of the men of fighting age, are conscripted. They're in the German army. They're fighting on the Eastern Front. So at the end of the war, they're imprisoned by the Soviets and sent off to Siberia. Um, they're, after the war, they come back in about 1948 or so. Um, and the family is reunited. Um, but so, can you go back, please? <laughs> wasn't ready. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. And Thank you. So, yeah. One. Thank you. Okay. So, um, in any event, uh, this this pastry cookbook, which was their father's, was just um, incredibly meaningful to them because. Just after the war, food is scarce. They hear the stories of how there was so little to eat from their relatives that they would literally cage through this book, just kind of looking at those pictures of recipes and kind of keep hunger pains at bay. Um, and so the two of them came to Canada um, in late 48. Um, no, thank you. So in this picture here is um, Inga Bendra, uh Brodecker, who's the baby, her mother Milda, and her their grandmother, her grandmother. Well, Inga is only two years old at the time of the sinking, so naturally she does not recall the torpedo attack. Um, she doesn't recall the sinking or her mother's rescue. However, um, when uh, Inga and her family after the war get um, at, you know spend time in a DP camp and come to Australia, and as she gets older, she starts to ask her mother 
you know, a lot of questions and her mother tells Inga the story and her mother writes the, the story down for Inga. And so they really talk about it quite often. And uh, when I spoke with Inga, she said, you know, one of her mother's greatest hurts was that people laughed at the notion that she had survived the world's worst maritime disaster. And they always dismissed the idea that a young mother and a, and a baby, a two-year-old, were aboard the goose log. And that was something that I heard from a lot of the survivors. Um, for example, Alan, who you had seen in the previous slide, mentioned how years after the war, she didn't really like to talk about it with anyone. She felt at one point comfortable enough to bring it up with colleagues of hers. And as she's just about to tell them the story, her colleague, and this is in the 50s, um, or late 50s says, you know, we just had it really hard during the war. And this is, mind you, two women from Canada. This is because we had to use margarine. And so at that point, Ellen decided maybe I'll wait another 20 or 30 years to, to share my story. So, no, so here you can, this is Horst as a little baby. Um, and it's just, a, I think, a dear photo of Horst with his grandparents. Um, sort of this one, again, these pre-war photos. In speaking with Horst, he talked very fondly of his grandparents and of how growing up, he grew up in Elbing, um, that when he was young, his mom would put him on the train to visit his grandparents, just with a little sign around his neck. Um, and when that changed, when he was no longer just to make that short trip, um, and then he started to remember soldiers coming into the street, you know, his, his childhood is changing. Um, and they, though, his father, again, is conscripted, and they don't leave until about January 28th, 29th, when um, someone from the Hitler Youth comes knocking on their door and says, now you can go, and so they fled. <coughs> so this is the um, infamous um, Alexander Marinesco of the S-13. Now, one thing I like about uh, when I work on a book is that I often you know, I would choose a subject that interests me. I'm clearly fascinated with history, but I also, it's an opportunity for me to learn. Um, and that's just a little preamble into about learning about the Russian Navy and the, and the submarines. You know, I came of age culturally when, you know, Tom Clancy and Hunt for Red October and so sort of these kinds of books and movies were really coming out. So I grew up with this notion that you know, the, the Soviet Navy was just incredibly, you know, all-powerful, and that's sort of what we were, kind of the Hollywood version. Well, of course, as you know, that's not really true. Um, the Soviet Navy did not start out so strong in World War II. Um, it's certainly in the Baltic Sea, the Germans, you know, the German Navy had control of the Baltic Sea for much of the war. Um, what was interesting to learn, too, is about submarine officers like Marinesco. They came up through the ranks of the merchant marines, and if they had medal and proved their qualifications, um, they would then you know, serve a tour as an executive officer on a submarine, assume their own command. Um, Marinesco, who was responsible for firing and gave the order to fire on the Gusla, was one such officer. He's also an officer who is incredibly adored, he's revered by his men, and not so much by his uh, commanding officers and his superiors. He, he came very close to being courts martialed um, for fraternizing with a woman of ill repute, uh, to put it politely, um, and, and flouting, uh, uh, you know, he, he flouted orders um, repeatedly, he would exaggerate, you know, his uh, sort of after action, you know, his briefing. So that's why, in part, the story of what he did is buried, because there was doubt over what he had done. You know, he, he was hoping for fame and glory. He actually was not um, awarded here at the Soviet <coughs> Union until Gorbachev, but then Marinesco's dead. There is, however, a huge statue um, to Marinesco today in Kalingrad, which remember is Konigsberg, where many of these refugees uh, came from. The next uh, picture here is uh, Captain Wilhelm Zahn. There were military captains, you know, military and civilian leadership aboard the Guslav um, that night. 
And the reason, again, is because you have the thousands of civilians, but there is the German Navy piece of it. Um, there was really no agreement between both over how best to cross the Baltic. Um, they argued about speed, they argued what course to take, they argued about navigation lights, and of course, again, that uh, goes into greater detail in the book. There was a board of inquiry, I will tell you that, after the sinking where Will, Will Zahn um, did testify. Um, and he definitely uh, knew how to sort of point the finger, but not to take shared responsibility for what happened that evening um, in terms of you know, all the decisions made. So this is a little bit murky, but uh, I was fortunate to meet someone who dove the wreck. Um, the goose luck in the very, uh, in the 40s and 50s, 60s, so forth, you could not dive. You know, that was, uh, the Soviets were diving the wreck. Um, later, the you could get a permit, and you can today through the, uh, not today, but there was a window where you could get a permit to dive the wreck through the Polish government. And Mike Boring is a diver that I interviewed, and he graciously shared these photos with me. Um, if you can go back, please. Not ready for that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, what was amazing is that the, um, the, <laughs> the railing is still quite intact, the deck is still intact, but as Mike explained to me, what was just really striking and very eerie is that there are no remains. There's nothing really left down there. Um, and he, you know, other divers, and, and Mike included, who have been in other parts of the Baltic, he said, you know, that's, that's unusual. Um, the, the ship itself is also really had been picked clean by the Soviets um, who uh, were looking, there's a lot of theories over what they were looking for, um, none substantiated. There are theories that it had the amber room on it. There are theories that it had advanced weapon systems on it. And, and again, you know, these are sort of the stuff of, um, I would say, thrillers. Um, there's really no, nothing to show that. Um, now I think we're missing the one of the stairwell, but you can leave it on that, that's okay. Um, I had a, a slide here of the stairwell, again, to just kind of, um, nope. <laughs> well, it's okay, um, just to show you again, sort of visualizing just when, you know, for the people trying to get up these very narrow little stairwells, trying to make it to um, the lifeboats, and here, which is a little tough with the divers near the letters. The, the word Wilhelm Gusloff is still very, very much intact, um, you know, all these years later. So with that, I, um, oh, there's, there's the stairwell. So you can just sort of imagine, you know, what that might, might have been like. And sort of thinking about that, um, I'll just leave you with one more thought because I've been asked, well, because there were German Navy aboard, you know, there was military aboard, did that make it a legitimate target for Marinesco, notwithstanding the thousands of refugees? And um, I would say that wherever you come down on that question, whatever you read and you decide, um, you know, you really can't uh, take away the fact that it's a tragedy in the, the numbers of people aboard and the numbers of civilians that are aboard that night. And so with that, I would definitely uh, welcome any questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone to arrive so that we can uh, get you on camera and hear the question. I'm curious, how does one go about tracking down the people uh, so many years after the event? Um, that's a great uh, question. Well, it started with Horst. So uh, Horst was the first person that I met that I was able to interview. And from Horst, it, I said, you know, who do you know? And what's interesting is he keeps in touch with some of these survivors. None of them knew each other at the time. But because it was sort of this small club of, of people, he had some names and addresses. And so from one would come another. Some of them, um, there's a, a woman I interviewed, Rita Rowan, and she's, uh, she's down in Washington, D.C., and her uncle was a sailor aboard the Goose Law. And that was using social media, believe it or not. Um, so it, I decided um, 
I think I, one day, like on Facebook, I started putting in names and sort of coming up with names. And I would, again, it's sort of, you know, this cold call. So you feel a little weird, but are you perhaps, you know, the reader related to? And so that was one way to do it. Um, other names were, you know, gleaned from records from, from the archives. But really, with the survivors, a lot of them keep this very small community. And so once I had established this rapport with Forrest, I think others felt comfortable enough to talk um, to me. I've right, got a couple of questions here in just a second. Wait for the microphone. Just a question about the um, Soviet uh, commander. He made the decision to um, torpedo the ship all on his own. There was no further communication with Soviet authorities in any way? Right, so the, the question about the orders, how Marinus was decided to fire on the ship. The orders were, were broadly interpreted by him. So once he saw the Guslov, he did not ask for permission to, sh to fire on it. Um, the orders were pretty broad to the Soviet submarines as they were to the, you know, the Germans were doing the same, which was they wanted to sink anything, and he wanted to sink anything German. Um, of course, at the time, so uh, the Soviets knew, though, that civilians were massing along these towns all along the Baltic Sea. When Horst left, the Russian, the, the Soviet tanks were in Elbing. Um, the Battle of Konigsberg, Kalingrad, is going on in, in people see at night, you know, the flares. So the, the Soviets knew, but again, I mean, there's an excellent book, I'm sure many of you know Timothy Snyder's book, <coughs> Bloodlands, which really talks about the Eastern Front. The uh, barbarism, um, and, and that just feels like an understatement, but uh, was just sort of beyond, and so the Nazis and the Germans as they invaded the Soviet Union, um, you know, I think that the Soviets saw this also as an act of vengeance, you know, it was going to come to them as well. Yes, just a second please. Is there ever any evidence that SS men or other people were trying to get away from the Russians via the boat? Um, well, there were Nazi party officials on the board as well. There were some party leadership aboard. You know, what people's ranks were, um, I don't have any evidence of who was SS or who was not, but there, was, there were definitely, um, you know, Nazi party leadership aboard. There were some, you know, um, not really high ups, but, you know, people who had been leaders in their towns and cities who were aboard. Catherine, I have a question for you. Sure. What, what are the rules of engagement that work here? What kind of markings uh, should that ship have had which would have insulated um, the, uh, the ship from being torpedoed? What, what was it that the Russians would have obeyed and um, uh, refrained from firing torpedoes? Well, I think it's a good question, and I, I um, well, so we, you know, I've been asked if it had hospital, if it had Red Cross markings, would that have insulated the ship? And I, I would have to say probably not. I, I don't think that the Soviets would have, you know, that would have protected it. So it almost becomes, with it, the talk of it being a legitimate military target because of the Navy comes a lot from the uh, Russian side today. You know. Marinesco is now considered it here, and there's a lot of talk about this was okay because there were no markings and it was gray and there were Navy aboard. But I think if you, you sort of step back and you say, well, okay, they're going to put hospital markings, but they have not done it. But we, every, you know, there was the evidence of what they were doing to civilians as they marched towards Berlin itself. So I don't think that that would have protected. I'm just curious as how long was the voyage uh, and, and where within the voyage was it sunk? Where did the ship go down and in how many feet of water? So um, it was supposed to take about 12 hours. Um, the ship went down in about 150, it's about 150 feet now. It rests at about 150, 200 feet in the Baltic Sea. The, the, the Baltic Sea itself is very shallow. Um, but it was only about you know four hours or so into its trip out, so it was, it was pretty 
early in in the crossing um, and and people other refugees you know part of the reason to not let anyone know about it initially was one this is the pride and joy you know not good for morale but also because of the thousands upon thousands waiting to board similar ships either of this size or smaller you know they were trying to, I think to hope not to create too much panic mm -hmm. Uh, question. Yeah. Of the uh, survivors that you interviewed, what did they tell you about their rescue? Um, so the rescue for them, um, so I'll, use, I'll give you an example with Helga's story, for example. Helga uh, did not get into a lifeboat. Um, Helga and her sister make the decision to slide down into the sea because they can see that the ship is sinking. Yeah. Helga does see a lifeboat and makes it, oh, tries to get into the lifeboat. Um, the lifeboat wasn't full, but people uh, started beating on people's hands to try to not let them in. So to give you a little bit of a taste of the, uh, the chaotic feeling, um, she finally gets into the lifeboat and you know people don't necessarily survive once you're in a lifeboat it didn't mean that you were also going to make it you know people had to, were um, exposed to the water the elements um in the time um someone like horst who did make it into a lifeboat and i definitely won't tell you his story um but it's you know a little suspenseful but they they make it some people make it into a lifeboat, but because it's so cold, the davits had frozen and the lines just snapped and just they were just dumped into the sea. Yeah. Um, if you made it into a lifeboat and you survived that, um, any of the, the boats, some of the boats that were in the area, for example, the, um, there was a T-36, there was a torpedo boat that picked up um, a few hundred people. They pull people aboard, you know, one by one, get them aboard and take them to this island of Rugen where they were processed um, the Red Cross had you know taken down information unfortunately some of those records that were destroyed by the Soviets in the um, uh, in the final months of the war yeah just a minute other than this thinking, what else did the uh, Russian captain accomplish in the war? Uh, well, um, he sank another ship after this. <laughs> so he did that um, just about a week or so later. Um, after the war, he ended up working in a blood transfusion center. Um, he actually died uh, not quite penniless, but certainly with no you know, glory attached to his name. Um, he was maligned for a long time, and then uh, by the time Gorbachev was in power, uh, there's sort of this movement to bring him back, and he was posthumously, you know, um, you know, recognized for what he did. Do you have any insight as to who in the Nazi um, hierarchy made the decision to finally let them go? Um, I think that Admiral Donitz can definitely be uh, can I say, credited for Operation Hannibal. Um, it was really clear, you know, at that point, uh, January, you know, civilians and desertions, even though anyone trying to desert was executed, there was definitely this sense. And so they thought at that point, you know, convinced Hitler to allow these civilians to go. And but by the end of January, much of those, the land routes were closed off. Um, Helga actually tried to go by train first, but that wasn't possible. So the next option was to just try to get people off um, by sea. So. Do you know how these people made it to Canada or any of these other countries? Is that part of your story? Yeah, um, they, so after the war, some of them were able to just join up with family in other parts of Germany. Um, some of them were in DP camps, and most of them, you know, they applied. They went uh, through, you know, there were quotas after the war. So, um, you know, someone like Helga, she was able to get um, immigration papers to the U.S. She came to the U.S. Um, Irene and her sister, they got, you know, the lottery for them was uh, Canada. For Horst, Canada came through. So it was um, sort of you would apply and see where you ended up. Many also ended up in the UK. 
Um, a, a few stayed in uh, Germany. You'll read about a woman named Ava um, in the book, and she she did not leave for you know to go abroad. Uh, one more question, maybe two. Uh, Catherine has a long ride back to Connecticut, so we want to respect that. Uh, could you talk about the nationalities that were on the boat? Uh, clearly, if they were in the DP camp, they were not Germans at that point. So could you talk, and you did say there was a Latvian uh, people on board. Can you talk about the nationalities that were on the boat? Sure. Um, well, some of them, so, well, um, someone like Horace, they were German, they grew up in East Prussia. Um, someone like the Chinkor, uh, so their last name, they're married, but uh, they were Latvian originally. Um, most of, you know, a lot of the survivors, a lot of the people, you know, grew up in East Prussia. Some had come from Poland. Um, actually, Inga's family was in Poland first, but then because of looking for other jobs, you know, back in the, you know, I think it was like in the 20s, some of them decided to go to East Prussia for jobs. So people, you know, were moving around a lot. Um, and there were, there were also, you know, Germans aboard too. Okay, if there are any more questions, um, I want to remind everybody uh, that we encourage our members to buy our uh, author's books. They're $20. It's a good buy. It's a wonderful read. And thank you very much, Catherine, for a wonderful lecture.